Hello and uh, good noon everybody. I am Dokara Anayark Bondok from the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority Batch of 1994. And I'm speaking in behalf of the Aging and Longevity webinars theme of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority. We are streaming live today from the video conference room of the UP Manila Information Management Service. Our time in Manila now is exactly 12 noon and we have a, a large number of registered to the webinar from all over the Philippines and from other countries as well. Wow, we have viewers from Albania, Bahrain, Fiji, Japan, Papua New Guinea, Qatar, Singapore, UAE, and the USA. And Dami, no? So this webinar series has really become very popular. It runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019. And it's in honor of uh, the Music Mafi anniversary. And we will be delivering interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. So today's webinar was awarded 10 PMA CME units for doctors and two CPD units for nurses. CPD units for physicians and pharmacists are still pending. So for today's webinar, we are most privileged and it's a huge honor for me personally to have a distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine. And this title po, distinguished alumna, kulang na kulang po yan sa accomplishments ni ma'am. From the UP College of Medicine as our speaker, she is uh, former Dean Dr. Agnes D. Mejia, and she's a graduate of the UP College of Medicine class of 1977. Uh, dean Dr. Mejia, as we all know, is the most recent past Dean of the UP College of Medicine, where she served for three whole terms. And she was also the chair of the Department of Medicine at UPPGH from 2004 to 2012, as, as well as the chairman of the Philippine Special Society of Nephrology Specialty Board in the year 2004. Her multiple awards in, in the field of medicine and medical education were given by the Philippine Society of Nephrology in 2004, the UPMAS Distinguished Teacher Award in 2008, most Distinguished Senior Consultant Department of Medicine in 2012, the UPMAS Distinguished Alumna in 2015, and the Gloria T. Aragon Centennial Award for Most Illustrious Faculty very recently. Dr. Mejia practices and holds clinic, if you want to be consulted by this Distinguished Doctor, at the Philippine Heart Center. And Dr. Mejia is both a nephrologist and a critical care specialist. And we are very privileged to have her today, ma'am. Thank you, Anna. And uh, good, good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And for today, I chose diabetic nephropathy, specifically OPD management. So I'd like to take you to my clinic and I'd like you to look into my thought process on how I handled these three patients. So this is going to be a case-based lecture. Our first case is ADL. She's an employee, 32 years old, female, type one diabetic since 17 years old with normal blood pressure. First consult in July, 2015 in my clinic at Heart Center. I think I was the second or third nephrologist she consulted. And she had foamy urine, she had weight gain, she had a rapid increase in creatinine, which was her problem and her 24 hour total protein was 2.68 grams and her creatinine clearance was only 28. So before I proceed with her case, I would just like to show you the natural history of type one diabetic nephropathy. This I'm sure you know very well. You have five stages, one, two, three, four, and five. Five is end stage. And down here, it will show you that in the pre-diabetic stage, your GFR is increased, your glomeruli are hypertrophied, and in stage three, we call this the incipient diabetic nephropathy. You have some microalbuminuria, you can have hypertension, and the glomeruli show thickening of the basement membrane, mesangial expansion, and the bad part is on stage four or stage five, when from microalbuminuria, you now have overt proteinuria, many with nephrotic range proteinuria. And this is the time when your GFR drops relentlessly 
up to the point of developing end-stage renal disease. So what happened to our patient? Well, she consulted me in July 2015. In July 2015, her creatinine then was 287. First thing I did was to look for the urinalysis, and she had plus three protein, red cells only three to five, and her 24 hour total protein was 2.7. I like looking in the past, and I like looking at old records. And true enough, seven months prior to this consult, her creatinine was only 94. If you look at the natural history of diabetic nephropathy in type 1, seven months is too rapid to develop a progressive renal failure unless you have other events that produce them. So in November 2014, the urinalysis already showed plus 4, but the RBC was only 0 to 2. So reviewing the history and the labs, in November 2011, four years prior to consult, she had a very good 2D echo with a 60% ejection fraction, normal KUB ultrasound, protein was negative, blood pressure was normal. December 2013, her fluorescein angiography was negative. This is very important to emphasize because they say that the concordance rate between proteinuria and diabetic retinopathy can be as high as 98, which means that if her fluorescein angiography is negative, then we can say with comfort that maybe she still doesn't have diabetic nephropathy. But in March, she started developing plus four proteinuria, and in July to September, she had some esophagitis, but the creatinine was only 94 in spite of the protein of plus four. Then in February, she had many years disease. February 2015, she had a video systemography test. She had some vestibular disorder. February 2015, she had a normal cranial MRI. And I think what was terrifying was that in March 2015, from a negative fluorescein angiography a year before, she suddenly had blurring of vision, she had macular edema, laser treatment, and an increase in creatinine. So what I see here is a lady, a very young lady with type one, who in a very short span of time, suddenly developed blurring of vision, edema, elevated creatinine, and protein in the urine. So we con I continued to follow her, and creatinine kept on increasing. The renal scintigraphy showed a normalized GFR of only 16 ml per minute from a previous of 28. Her whole abdominal ultrasound was not very exciting at all. And so my question is, is this rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis due to a non-DM glomerular disease? Because the kidney that deteriorated so quickly in seven months, the protein developed in less than seven months, and the eyes are that bad. If you look at the urinalysis, she's not badly nephritic. And when I say that, the RBC, you know, is not too much. In very nephritic, nephrotic individuals, you would see a lot of red cells. But definitely she's nephrotic because the protein is plus three. So, you know, the rapidity of the deterioration in renal function would make you think of rapidly progressive GM, maybe due to a non-diabetic glomerular disease, but the urinalysis, unfortunately, doesn't support that. So we decided to do hemodialysis in preparation for a kidney biopsy, because at that time, the creatinine was already 559. 498, going up so rapidly from July to a few months later. And lo and behold, there was no RPGN. There were no crescents. But what we found is the typical nodular glomerulosclerosis, 
shown here, there's thickening of the arterioles. There is some acute tubular necrosis and there are some interstitial fibrosis. So the kidney biopsy officially was sent out as no other than diabetic glomerulosclerosis with some interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy, moderate arterial sclerosis, hyal arterial sclerosis, and focal acute tubular injury. So there was no rapidly progressive GN. So the next question is, is this an accelerated atherosclerosis in a type one diabetic patient? In December, 2013, angiography was negative. March, 2015, she had sudden blurring of vision. And these are the eye grounds from February to June. And this was given to me by Dr. Lala Arroyo, her ophthalmologist. And I really owe Lala some this gratitude because it was Lala Arroyo who told me, Mom, is there anything vascular happening to this patient? The eyes are just getting so bad and the kidneys are getting so bad. So for the first time in my practice, I thought of borrowing the slides and I think you will really appreciate this because these things are happening in this lady's eyes. So these are the fundi. You see the cotton wool. You see the microangiopathy. You see the vitreous hemorrhage. And there are venous bleeding. These are all courtesy of Dr. Arroyo. More cotton wool spots. I'm sure the students would appreciate this. More him. More blood, venous vitreous heme. I mean, how can one see with this kind of fundus? That's the right eye. Cotton wool, thickening, blood in the eyes, more blood in the eyes, and this is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And this is the time when she practically couldn't see anything, and you can see why. There you go. The left eye with increasing vitreous heme. She was practically blind then. And so from September to October, she had surgery. So the key points here, accelerated atherosclerosis in diabetes. I think it's important to know that diabetes is associated with an increased risk of arterial occlusive disease in the coronary, cerebral, and peripheral vascular bed. I would consider the eyes as peripheral in this case. Diabetes is associated with increased prevalence of unstable inflammatory and lipid-rich plaques. Hyperglycemia has so many effects from the macrophage to the endothelium, to the platelet, to the matrix, such that if you look at the scheme, uncontrolled hyperglycemia affects so many areas in the entire body that one can see effects in others. I think what is important to realize is that they don't do it at the same phase. You know, it may be getting worse in the eyes, but not in the kidney. But in many essence, hyperglycemia, diabetes per se, can affect so many micro parts in our body. And if you want other references, you can go through this. So we finally did the hemodialysis and the kidney biopsy. Fortunately, she had spontaneous pneumothorax while undergoing dialysis. And she was supposed to have a living non-related donor, but on the day she was admitted, we noted that the donor had herpes. Oh so the donor had vesicles, the kidney transplant was deferred, and eventually after a few weeks, it was done in April 2017. And after the transplant, many months after the transplant, up to the current time, her creatinine is normal. In between, she would have some CMV and MSG allergy suspect, but overall, she's doing very well. Her eyes are good. 
she is back to work in the office and she does computer work. So going back to the eyes, from December 2015 to 2016, she had laser treatment, she had anti-VGF, she had surgery of both eyes. And look at those white dots. Those are the laser shots. No, too many. And going back to that, now she can see. She can even do computer work. It's amazing what eye surgery can do. And I think what's most important is how amazing this lady is. Her office may raise funds for her transplant to be pursued. So in summary, ADL, our type one diabetic, has accelerated atherosclerosis, hemodialysis, and kidney transplant very successful as of this time. Now, our second case is AM. He's a senior citizen, and he would go very well with the theme of this webinar. He's a retired PNB employee. Oh, he's not senior, but he's now senior. I've been seeing him for several years now. He was 57 when he first consulted. He had type 2 diabetes in 1996, hypertension 2003, CKD 2011. He had laser, he had family history, seven siblings, five of seven with diabetes on insulin, one had an acute MI. What is the clue here? If your patient had received laser therapy for diabetic retinopathy, very highly likely that that patient also has diabetic nephropathy. These are all microvascular disease. So here I would plot for you the serum creatinine from 2011 to 2017. You would see that in this gentleman, the creatinine is slowly creatinine over six years, 17. And this is the hemoglobin A1C. You would see that the hemoglobin A1C as a marker of diabetic control is really not good. You know, he would still go up to as high as 8.4. And usually when he gets these spikes in hemoglobin A1C, he would tell me that he went to the province, couldn't find insulin, and so the blood sugar is poorly controlled. Again, if I plot the serum creatinine, and here's the systolic blood pressure, you would also see that the blood pressure is not properly controlled. And the last graph, again, the serum creatinine. And this is what we're all waiting for. When the serum creatinine goes up, blood pressure is poorly controlled, blood sugar is poorly controlled, then you have the onset of your overt proteinuria. The 24-hour total protein would flip from 5.3 to 2 to 4.93 very poor control of all size. There are so many clinical trials that show that control of proteinuria is very important in long-term survival, both of the kidney and of the patient. And this is the graph from KDGO. This is low risk. The yellow is slightly increased risk. Orange is moderately increase. And this is when you have end-stage renal disease. What is the bottom line here? If your protein is increased, you have a very high chance of eventually ending up in kidney failure. So the goal is really to convert this high protein to normal or less than one gram. What is the evidence now for RAS blockers? There are actually no data supporting additional benefit on CKD outcome in patients with normal or microalbuminuria over blood pressure control in terms of using RAS blockers. No data to support advantage on CKD outcome in elderly without proteinuria. The only place where there's a definitive data for RAS to slow diabetic nephropathy 
is in advanced proteinuric disease. What is the message of this slide? The message is blood pressure control should be first and foremost, whether your patient has normal albumin or microalbumin, you can practically use any drug that should lower the blood pressure. It is only when your patient, like our case today, when they have advanced proteinuria, that RAS blockade has been shown to slow down diabetic nephropathy. There are multifactorial intervention strategy recommended in diabetic kidney. The hemoglobin A1C should be individualized, but generally about 7%. Your target DP should be less than 130 over 80. You are advised to use ACE or ARBs when the albumin excretion is evident. And lipid lowering is very, very important, although statins not recommended in patients on hemodialysis. But lower your lipids and you help the kidney. So intensive glucose control reduces the risk of microalbuminuria. There's no doubt about this. This is almost like the Bible. And intensive glucose control reduces risk of overt proteinuria. Again, no doubt about this. But I think the best example how glucose control can reverse kidney injury is shown in this slide. This is a 33-year-old woman with type 1 diabetes of 17 years duration at the time of transplant. This lady had a pancreatic transplant, not a kidney transplant. Before that pancreatic transplant, this is what she had. She had nodular glomerulus sclerosis, very typical. Five years after transplant, there were less glomerulus sclerosis. There was still mesangial expansion. This is five years after pancreatic transplant. But look at her kidneys. After 10 years post-pancreatic transplant with perfectly normal sugar, it's a perfect biopsy. So this is the symmetry. You need 10 years to develop diabetic nephropathy, and you need another 10 years to reverse all those lesions once you get a very successful pancreatic transplant and normal sugar. I think this is the classic example of how sugar control can eventually lead to normal biopsy after pancreatic transplant. If you translate this to other patients, if you have a patient whom you had a kidney transplant, but your sugars are poorly controlled, your diabetes is poorly controlled, then that patient post-transplant has a fair chance that maybe he or she can develop diabetic nephropathy. Lowering blood sugar is associated with lower frequency of renal events. So this is your systolic. As your systolic blood pressure goes up, the events also goes up whether you use ACE, shown here in blue, versus placebo, shown in orange. ACE inhibitors reduce albuminuria and preserve renal function better. And if you use angiotensin II receptor blockers, the effects are the same. Statins definitely improve because it reduces cardiovascular risk. And if you want to attain multiple treatment targets to lower the risk of ESRD, your hemoglobin A1C should be less than 7%, blood pressure less than 130 over 80, cholesterol is controlled, and if albumin persists, you can use ARB, ACE, or the direct inhibitors. So with these multiple interventions, you can reduce the risk of end-stage renal disease by as much as 60%. So in summary, AM, a retired PNB employee, what should we do? Good blood pressure control, good glucose control, a lot of patient education, and dual RAS blockade. My last case is LS. 
He's a lawyer. 67 years old, male. He had diabetes for more than 10 years, hypertension for more than 10 years. He had three laser sessions. He has been on insulin for more than 10 years. He was on angiotensin II receptor blocker for more than two years. And his 24 hour total protein is 4.8 grams. He came to clinic because they wanted to do cataract surgery. So they wanted a nephro clearance. But when he came, his creatinine was 600. So how can I clear someone with a creatinine of 600 has never been on dialysis. So the key here is to look backwards. So when he came, I looked at the urine. There was no protein. There was no red cells. I looked at the GFR, very low at 14%. I did a CT stonogram just to make sure there's no obstruction and there was no obstruction. He decides to good to the echo EF 46% with some hypokinesia. And so for me to clear, I need old records. And I'm very passionate about records because he came to see me in July, 2017. A few months before that, the creatinine was only 256. So what happened during that time that increased the creatinine triple? And following through, it was good that they have records. Urinalysis plus four. And I think it's the key here. His creatinine was near normal in March 2016. A year and a half later, it was up to 600. Since there is no obstruction, there is no acute MI, there is no hypotension, there is no dehydration, what then would cause the creatinine to go up this quickly in a matter of a year and four months? That is too soon. That is too quick as far as diabetic kidney disease is concerned. So in situations like this, where I couldn't find any actual precipitating cause, I always look at the fit. And if you look at the fit, both, huh? but I'm just showing you one, you would see that he has mottling. There's mottling here, mottling here, here. That's, those were not, his toes before, and a lot of mottling here. So I signed this out as cholesterol embolization. And here in my last case, I would just like to show you a few insights on renovascular, because thromboembolism, which is what he had pathophysiologically, is very close to atherosclerosis. Atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis is prevalent 50% or greater narrowing. People over age 60 with coronary stenosis, aortic aneurysm, aortic disease, lower limb occlusive disease, these are the population at risk of having atherosclerosis. In our patient, I have not proven if he had renal artery stenosis, but his kidney size are not equal. One is 11, the other one is nine. But I think what he had most recently is actually atheroembolism. And I wouldn't be surprised if you do a CT aortogram, you would see a lot of atherosclerotic plaques on the abdominal wall that eventually were thrown out and settled in the feet. And usually if you have atheroembolism, you know, the shower of emboli, they just go anywhere. You would see them in the feet. And if your patient has previously normal creatinine, you would see their creatinine to go up. 
And eventually, if these kidneys are blocked, these kidneys eventually decrease in size. So once you have blockage of circulation, the drop in kidney size can be very quick. So LS, I think, in the absence of hypotension, infection, heart attack, dehydration, I think he had an acute kidney injury secondary to cholesterol embolization. I put him on dialysis and still is on dialysis. He had cataract surgery five months later. So after having shown you all these three cases, one a type one, a very young lady with accelerated atherosclerosis, another one with poorly controlled diabetes and blood sugar, diabetes and blood pressure, and this with cholesterol embolization. Understanding diabetic kidney disease, what are the best options for clinical management? I still go by this. I think nowadays, I don't mean to be rude, but we tend to forget getting detailed history and minimizing our physical exam because we like to do so much diagnostics. So this is what I call the demise of history and physical exam and looking at records and not just relying on diagnostics. So ADL, the diabetic, the retired PNB, and the lawyer. The lawyer should have a halter because I think he has spontaneous atrial fibrillation. So this is the new term now. We have always called it diabetic nephropathy but diabetic kidney disease includes atheroembolic disease. That's your cholesterol plaque. If you haven't seen cholesterol emboli, that's your cholesterol emboli inside the renal arterial. And this is ischemic nephropathy. As you would see in renal artery stenosis, you would see the glomeruli very collapsed, very ischemic. This is what you see in renal atherosclerotic disease. And patients with diabetic kidney disease can have infection, can have interstitial fibrosis. And this is what you would see. The tubules are scarred. So if you talk about diabetic kidney disease, it's no longer confined to the nodular glomerular sclerosis. You have to look at atheroembolic disease as our last case, ischemic nephropathy as our last case, even interstitial fibrosis as shown in the biopsy of the first case. In type two, the histopathologic changes are not just due to microangiopathy. You have to consider aging. You have to consider atherosclerosis. You have to consider hypertension. And you have to consider any episode of acute kidney injury. You have to look at metabolic syndrome. In the Philippines, it's high as 27% as of 2008. Prevalence of hypertension by age, 25.4, mostly about 50 postmenopausal for women. Diabetes mellitus by age goes well with the hypertension, about 7.1%, mostly in their mid 50s. This is Philippine data. If you look at the national incidence and prevalence of dialysis patients, it's rising and continues to rise from 2001 to 2015. Causes of kidney failure among patients starting dialysis from 2000 to 2013. Diabetes ranks number one. Hypertensive nephrosclerosis number two. Inflammation is actually glomerulonephritis. And this is no different from the states. The state's number one cause of end-stage renal disease is diabetes, followed by hypertension, followed by glomerulonephritis and cystic kidney disease. But if you look at the etiology of end-stage renal disease in transplants, we still like to transplant the younger ones. So the, the graph is reversed. We see more, we do more transplants in chronic GN 
but we are now doing more transplants as well for diabetic kidney disease and hypertensive kidney disease, even if they are elderly. 60 and above, many have gone through transplants. So I think that's what I prepared for you. I hope I have walked you through my clinic and look into my thought process. It would be nice to listen to you this time and find out what your thoughts are. Thank you. Um, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> That's what I could say. It's very erudite discussion. So we have uh, now 810 participants registered. We have 85 viewing through the UP Manila live stream, 66 through YouTube. Meron na pala tayong YouTube, ano? 182 through Facebook Live, and seven, seven group viewings from the UP College of Medicine, the UP College of Nursing, the UP Manila School of Health Sciences, Apollo Leite, the Flores Memorial Medical Center, La Cambini Diagnostic Corporation, Health Services Los Banos, and Dr. Rosales Memorial Hospital. That's wonderful. So, and dami nga hong uh, nanunood, and I think they were all... Um, ako po, I was... Um, ako, I was struck po by the... the it's by the parang length and breadth of kidney diseases na napakita po. Mm -hmm. And that uh, typical morning po sa inyo consists of what we, not only what we think of diabetic nephropathy, pero ang dami palang manifestations po nun. And kidney disease, as we can see, can strike all ages po and all uh, income levels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yun po yun nakuha ko dito. <laughs> and actually, I was alarmed. <laughs> Tanong ko po, just to start the questions, um, not, not all of us po are uh, kidney specialists, but we do see diabetic patients on a regular basis. And sometimes po, when we diagnose someone with diabetes for the first time, lalo na parang kuminsan po, medyo late na sila nagpapakita, mataas po yung kanilang uh, hemoglobin uh, A1C. It's so overwhelming po na you tell them, marami yung nade-depress sa akin kasi sinabi ko, okay, first of all, you have to stop eating. Second, di, kailangan baba yung BP. Then we have to, uh, yung glucose nyo po, then you have to reduce the amount of proteins. And then you have to start all these medications na nakakahilo po and napakamahal. Yeah. Can you give us a step-by-step? -step? Like, for example, somebody walks into your clinic. What is the first thing that you should suggest? And um, secondly po, so that the patient who hindi ho ma-overwhelm, Kasi po talaga, there will be, a, uh, the moment you get diagnosed with diabetes, para hong talagang, ang dami na hong mangyayari. So, can, can you give us a step-by-step -step po? Well, and wh usually, what would you yeah. do first para ho at least, kasi we, we all know kung sabugan po natin ng information yung pasyente, hindi na ho babalik yan eh. Well, first of all, I, I look, alam natin diabetic, alam natin hypertensive, alam natin ng overweight, and then, pag pumupunta sa akin, dahil, kidney specialist ako, they're always worried about the kidney. Opo, kasi I mean, talaga they everyone may, knows yeah, that. They uh, may not worry about stroke. They may not worry about MI, but you know, para kung na, 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 na siya talaga eh. Kasi, opo, they are so afraid of diabetic, of dialysis, which is understandable. So first thing is, I educate them on how to take their blood pressures. And if they can have blood pressure monitoring at home, then I do that. And then yung diet, I like to adjust to what they like because we tend to be so restrictive. Parang wala na hong makain eh. Parang wala na makain. Ang, ako, I go by small frequent feedings so you can reduce your weight. And not too salty, but salt to taste. And then I always like to find out what their job is, you know, kasi ang mamahal nga ng gamot. But there are also drugs that are very, very affordable when it comes to blood pressure control. So I like to know how much is their budget when it comes. And then I look at their medication list. And you would be surprised. Ang dami dami yung Ang haba. Pero maramihan naman, vitamins. Oh, oh, vitamins. Mga ano. Kung ano, ano. You know, like half of their medicines are actually supplements. So then I tell them, ito po pinaka-importante. Kung may budget kayo, hanggang dito lang. And then I, when it comes to the kidney, I only use a few tests. I want a urinalysis. Oh, oh. I want a creatinine. 
And then I work from there. Kasi kung from the test alone, wala namang mali one to sa gamot eh. Urinalysis, creatinine ang pinaka-importante. Then I can work from there. Okay. I, I don't request all. Kasi, hindi ko talagang like isang sabugan. Ay, hindi. Hindi, pwede, hindi no. pwedeng ganun. Then, so yun. So Siguro for kidney mo. evaluation, urinalysis, creatinine. If you want to go further, then the next step is getting an ultrasound. But one recommendation that's very, very important is from the time you diagnose a type 2, always have an eye consult. So, uh -oh. the moment po may diabetic, but yeah. patingin nyo lang. Lalo, lalo na type 2, type 2, kasama mo na yung yeah. So, we are being acknowledged, we are being asked to acknowledge MSDRs. So, ma'am, talagang blood pressure, weight control. Weight, blood pressure, weight control, and then kind of diet, and then if you want to be screened for kidney, Unahin na lang yung urinalysis and then serum creatinine. Pwede na sa akin yun. And of course, the rest would come, like cholesterol and all, they would come. Pero kung kidney, yun lang ang pinaka-importante. Iba kasi, nagpaparinos ka na kagad. Hindi, hindi pa naman dapat. So, hey, do not start the real no, no, no. scan. Just look, Siguro po, ultrasound, creatinine, yeah, and urinalysis. Oh, pwede, na yun. pwede na yun. And then move on from there. Yeah, and then... Maram, then when I do the physical exam on a diabetic, I really listen to all the vessels. You really have to do a good physical exam. Mama, ko hindi mo sad to say, hindi mo ako nakikinig sa mga vessels. No, hindi to. Dapat. Opo. Opo. And then, second question po. The Philippine diet is said to be very salty. Can you, and yung asawa ko po, mahili kumain ng tuyo. Sorry to report this. <laughs> but but ano ko bang, eh, mataas mong fishing nun. And I'm really worried about salt po sa diet ng Pilipino. Can you give us a commentary po dito? Well, um, salt sensitivity is not 100%. I think among mga Caucasians, maybe 30% are salt sensitive. Oh, and kasi usually, that was drilled yeah, into yeah, me. That, that, was the, salt. that was usually the older people. But if you look at Burton Rowe's book, salt can actually increase your blood pressure. Yung isang yung salt, ang effect non isang hydrochlorothiazide na 12.5. Yung high salt intake equivalent dyan sa 12.5 diuretic. So kung ayaw mo mag-diuretic, bawasan mo na lang. Pero ang hirap kasing kumain ng walang salt. So ang sinasabi ko, salt to taste but no added salt. Kasi you have to balance between being able to eat and not, and be happy. Uh -oh. or Kasi ho, kung masyado yung restricting, baka so naman na ako. With you because you don't want him to eat. No? Sa akin, so even the, my Mom, kidney patient... Mom, nagpapatis si. Huh? Nagpapatis. What's the point? It's totally... No? <laughs> I do not agree <laughs> with a patis-based diet or a uh, toyo-based yeah. diet. Ako talaga yung hindi ho. Pero wala kasing study on salt sensitivity sa Filipinos. Eh. But it's always safe to not have too much salt. It's better po na wag na magdata. Salt to taste. Yung iba naman kasi, family, they really don't put any salt and the patients can't eat. Wag naman ho ganun. Wag naman ganun. Oo. Pero wag naman ho yung idik-dik sa patis yung kinakain nyo because really that is not good. Ma'am, yung sa snacks po, yung snack and uh, uh, prevalence po of junk food ah that very high in salt talaga yun. very high in salt very high in calories um they're not good Saka even soft drinks soft drinks high in sodium yeah beer is high in uric acid i heard yeah. and Ma calories mom so no beer and uh, watch out talaga for junk food moderate lang moderate na lang Mama, anong meaning na moderate alcohol? Ikaw na lang sabi mo. <laughs> Kasi po, <laughs> ano, what's so your so comment on red yeah. wine po? A red wine is fine. Kasi okay, napansin ko po ito sa barangay, ah. Oh. Ayun, nagiinuman po yung mga tao doon. Hindi naman. Bigla na lang po may red wine doon. So sabi ko, ba't may red wine dito? Yung mga high blood po, oh. yun ang pinainom nila, yung red wine. Ako sa po yung red wine nila sa barangay siya. It's better than beer. Pero, you know, in moderation din po. Moderation or one serving, you know. Opo. So, not too much. Kasi yung nakikita ko po sa inuman ngayon, may red wine. Ah, talaga? Meron po. And then that's usually for people who would like to join the inuman, but we're barred po from drinking hard drinks. So, ang binibigay po sa kanila ay red wine. 
Social nga eh. But that's a uh, red wine, no? Inuman? Opo, ma'am. Meron po, lalo na ho, I live in a barangay. Pag uh-huh. may red wine ho, merong barangay captain hudo na medyo may edad na gustong sumama, uh-huh. but cannot drink hard anymore. Let's answer one for one of the questions. This is from Heidi Marita Gomez Albano. Would it be advisable that a, a routine analysis be done to hypertensive patients? Siguro ang tanong, what do you mean by routine analysis yeah. to hypertensive patients and to diabetics? Okay. Well, as a rule, if you have a young hypertensive, you need to do some extra workup, even if that individual has a family history of hypertension. What do I mean by this? A young hypertensive, maybe less than 30, 35. Pag diagnosed na hypertensive, may workup yan. And the most common cause of secondary hypertension is actually kidney disease, chronic GM. So young hypertensive, always. So what are this workup? Again, urinalysis, creatinine, maybe uric acid, and then an abdominal ultrasound. Now for a newly diagnosed hypertensive, regardless of age, we usually look at the good profile. So you really need the CBC. You want to screen for diabetes as well, or hypertensive tone. You want to screen for uric acid because of metabolic syndrome. You want to screen for dyslipidemia. So for an, for someone who's much older, na hypertensive, sinasama ko na lahat yan. Kasi uric acid, hypertension, magkakambal yan. Eh. Pagkadalasan may gout, may hypertension yan. So I put them all together, screening. Yeah. Yeah. Let me share ko lang. This personally happened to me. I just came back from the States. Oh. My best friend since elementary came to me and said she was hypertensive. We were both 33 years old. So first patient ko siya, libre pa. So <laughs> anyway, kinuha ko po yung BP 160. Oh. So I told her, okay, let's go out to lunch. So pinakain ko po ng full lunch. Okay? After which, ginala ko po kay Yvette Talusan, ah, who is also a nephrologist po. Classmate. Am I, and uh, ah, yes, our classmate. Yeah. So sabi ko, Yvette, i-BP mo to. So binipi niya 170. Sabi niya, your life is over. Pumasok ka na na ICU ng Cardinal. Chronic GM. Yeah. Na, and na, ano siya, nakikibayot siya siya sa Cardinal. Uh, NKI mo. Okay. Oh, but she had to control her BP po with a drip. Tsaka, hindi kasi nag-screen eh. I think it's routine to, at least you should have your blood pressure taken once or twice, let's put it said, twice or three times in a year. I think it's always nice for adults to have urinalysis once a year. Dapat po. Yeah, creatinine maybe not, pero most of this GN, they don't manifest with an elevated creatinine, but they would have abnormal urinalysis. Okay. So that put and what, one other lesson I learned is they're always diagnosed as UPI, Lalo na sa mga lalaki, men should not have UTI. No, because of Again, the lack of the statement pero, talaga yan. Pero pag ang lalaki always diagnosed as UTI, or women diagnosed as having UTI but no symptoms, you don't call them UTI. You call them abnormal urinalysis. Dapat yung workup na po yun. I go workup na talaga. And maraming, my first, when I was a resident in PGH, my first transplant patient, First, one of the first transplants in PGH. I remember his name very well, Edgardo Reyes. Very good looking. He came to me. I was a resident. He was diagnosed with end stage renal disease the day after he passed the engineering boards. I can always I can remember his face. He has this black eyeglasses. But it's sad because he. He was diagnosed with end stage renal disease the day after the boards was announced. And he's a graduate of UP. So out of my curiosity, I requested for his records at the UP infirmary. And lo and behold, all his urinalysis in the last abnormal. four years were all abnormal. A lot of red cells, a lot of white cells. And he was told to have UTI. That's not UTI. I think yung take away talaga dito ang lalaki mo hindi dapat magka-UTI. Yeah. So he had he had GN from the very start. Hindi na diagnosed. Well, it was diagnosed as UTI. So I think it's consciousness. So whenever they tell me I had UTI, ang susunod kong tanong is, may masakit ba? Pag wala, sabi ko baka hindi UTI mo. Hindi na. Baka abnormal urinalysis yun. Um, anong nangyari kay engineer? Well, we had 
transplant. Um, hindi ko matanda ko siya yung donor niya, a relative. But, yeah, but he's he did well naman. Uh, only a few years. And then he Ay, malungkot ma. Yeah. Oh, oh. Next question po is from Grace. Pamin to Anserano, how often should we screen for diabetes and atherosclerosis in the age group 50 and above? Well, if you, ang um, diabetes, you know, if you have a strong family history, I, I don't know exactly how often, but in my case, you know, when they come FPS see me, FPS hemoglobin A1C, together with urinalysis, diabetes yan. Laging kasamang FPS tsaka hemoglobin A1C. FPS is your blood sugar in the last 24 to 48 hours maybe, but hemoglobin A1C oh, is your yan. sugar control over the last three months. So laging magka-partner sila. May Mami, urinalysis laging. Ma'am, may tanong dito. Ha, and the, uh, later on, I'll add to this question. Hi, for... Hello, for pre-diabetic patients whose mother had diabetic kidney disease, when do you request for a 24-hour total urinary protein? Do you wait for the proteinuria or even in the absence of proteinuria in the urinalysis? And I said corollary to this, ano po ba ang pre-diabetic sa inyo? Okay. So yung una muna, ano yung uh, familial investigations? If you have a parent with diabetic kidney disease, particularly on dialysis. No, let's not take the parent. Halimbawa sibling, magkapatid tayo. Opo. And then you have, you have diabetic kidney disease. Then I am diabetic, but I don't have diabetic kidney disease. I have a 40% chance of eventually developing diabetic kidney disease. So early on, I should be screened. How do you screen? Making sure your sugar is controlled, always urinalysis, urine micro, my, urine micro test or urine micro albuminuria to creatinine ratio. And then I test. In other words, there's a very strong genetic component if diabetes runs in the family. I think a definition of pre-diabetic is the sugar is 105. Fasting, diabetic 126. Okay, oh, so yeah. Pero basta may strong family history ka, uh, ng diabetes, lalong lalo na kung na dialysis, the siblings are at risk. So you really have to control. But I think the good news is uh, you, sa isang uh, study, you really can reverse diabetic kidney disease if you catch them early, control your sugar, ma, ma lessen mo yung prevalence ng end stage renal disease. Mom? Question: As a internist, when and let's say all of us are taking care of diabetic patients, naman yung mawawala yung. When should we refer to, to a nephrologist? Um, let's well, say normal naman po si creatinine. Tapos yung urinalysis hindi naman po nagbabago. I was just struck po by the rapidity of this attack. Yeah. Parang yung accelerated po na Ay, yeah. kinabahan yeah. din mo ako dun eh. mga accelerated, makikita mo naman yan sa monitoring eh. Tapos, you don't have to refer right away kung diabetic, kung normal naman ang urinalysis, normal ang crea, maganda naman ang control. Okay. You can handle that. I think when you start seeing... Parang I was uh, struck po by the rapidity. Like for example, yung, oh, yung pasyente, yung first, bigla na lang, magpapanik din po ang no, any yung, yung, yung first case, I, the reason I show that is, I think... She's also my first case of accelerated, very, very quick, very anion. Basically, bata pa ho, eh. bata 32. Pero kung meron ng problema sa mata, then mag screen na kayo for urine microalbumin or protein. Okay. Pero kadalasan may refer sa amin pag bumababa na yung uh, GFR. Tapos iko compute mo rin yung GFR, kasi kahit na normal yung creatinine. The GFR may not be normal. So, dapat po i-compute. So, compute oh, do not stop at a normal creatinine. No, no, no. Absolutely not. So, question po dito. Most of my patients in the hemodialysis center are asking about the efficacy of insulin plants. And nabanggit nyo na nga ako yung mga supplements, ano? I haven't heard of insulin plants in med school. Are they really useful or just a form of traditional medicine? Insulin. And what are, what are the... Ano po ba ang insulin plants? Like, what could they be? Well, At kung meron ba talaga? Hindi, mahuhula lang ako. Insulin plants, baka yun yung mga ano. Well, may nagsabi mo sa akin na ashitaba, but I can't ah, know. Ashitaba po. yung mga ano, oh, po. yung mga leaves. Uh, I don't know. So Pero wala akong kayo talaga. Sa, you cannot kasi, recommend any plants. Sa mga dialysis patients, baka I don't know. Baka ako yung ampalaya. Oh, 
I don't do herbal treatment for dialysis patients because we don't know their potassium content. We don't know their sodium content. I think I'm more concerned about potassium content of these things. Mas abnormal yung kidney, I discourage them from herbal. Mom, powerful statement po yan. Huh? And I think that people need to learn about this yeah. also. That um, wag lang po yung sometimes we just as doctors po para to avoid arguments pinapabayan nila natin mga supplements but we don't know po what no. uh, potassium or other uh, ano they may kanina. want to the Irma ano uh, Cecil Lasarte our the head of our Institute of Herbal Medicine they published a book on herbal plants ang ganda ng libro nila it's all written down there so they can take a look it's already available in press uh, I don't know kung available sa National Bookstore. So, ito ko, siguro nasagot nyo na yun. Would you recommend serpentina tea and tablets? So, I, I guess that serpentina tea or tablets. I guess the answer is no, mama. No po. Basta Mabang nakadialysis, hindi ako. Ayaw nyo. Her endocrinologist recommended to avoid taking any food supplements with diabetes and hypertensive drugs. The cardiologist, however, recommended to take fish oil. Is this Okay. Uh, may pwede pagkagamit naman ng fish oil. Depends on your cardiovascular status din. Meron naman. Siguro you should eat salmon na lang. <laughs> so that, kasi po naturaling yun. So sige ma'am, I think a few takeaways, no? What I really, what really struck me po is that um, there are a lot of ano po, talagang grabe na ho ang diabetes. It can be considered an epidemic. It is. It is. And after 15 years talagang may mangyayari po talaga sa kidney ng tao. No? There are a lot of presentations of diabetic uh, diseases in the outpatient setting. And I think we should be aware of them and not just stop po sa mga hanggang urinalysis or creatinine yeah. lang. Dapat mag, we should think further. Yeah, yeah and have a deeper suspicion po of underlying kidney disease, lalo na po if their eyes are affected. So, sige po. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's no, no, been a very you. enlightening discussion. Yeah. A lot of people asked about food supplements. Ang sagot ni ma'am, hindi. At wala rin mag <laughs> Naman, ma'am, or at least be cautious. Opo, be cautious. Kasi yeah, for all we know, that could be causing problems in itself. Also, don't just accept abnormal uh, urinalysis. Tingnan nyo po yan. That's the most important message. So again, uh, in behalf of the Mu Sigma Phi sorority, we would like to thank our esteemed speaker, Dean Agnes Mejia, for taking time out of her very busy schedule to be with us today. It's truly an honor, ma'am, and I really learned a lot. And dami ko na hong narinig about diabetes, but this was one of the most extensive. We'd also like to thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. And special thanks goes to Mark Sharp and Dome for their support to this webinar. So we are also thankful and grateful to the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, the UP Manila Information Management Service, the DOS, the ASDI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. And most of all, we'd like to thank everyone who joined us today, and thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. So to receive your certificates of attendance, please answer the evaluation form nakalagay po dun sa aming Facebook page within two days to receive your certificate of attendance email to your registered email address. And uh, please expect the email to arrive within two to four weeks depending kung sa dami po na nanood. Mukhang marami. So we are going to be here every uh, second and last Friday of the month. And mom, thank you so much. Thank you. Talagang maganda thank you. po yung sinabi nyo and very thank enlightening. You. So thank you so thank much. You. Ayan po. Our next, today is uh, Fe February 22. So our next is March, 20, March 8, 2019 with aging and longevity among healthcare professionals. Aray ko. <laughs> Very good. Oh, oh, ma'am, very extensive po yung sinabi niyo. Ma'am, yung sa kolesterol.